Ah, well, good to see you all here. It's been a while since I've done something like this. <laughs> but it's nice to be here. Slightly nerve-wracking. But I think we'll be all right. <laughs> All right, well, first and foremost, I just want to uh, give honor to Pastor Mark. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to God's people. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, amen. Well, as Pastor Mark has just said, um, we're, un- we're in this series of presence and power. And um, first and foremost, I just really want to start off by, by asking a question. What are the things that you are passionate about? What are the things that, no matter what the challenge is, no matter what the circumstance is, you are willing to push forward, you're willing to go for it and pursue it without a doubt? Though the doubt comes, you push through it. What are those things that you are connected to? Think about them just for a moment. And just as you think about them, I want you to realize something. That that passion, that determination, that hunger that you have, that is within you, that is a unique and precious thing that God has given. See, I want you to know that God has given every single one of us a unique passion and a unique hunger. But many of us have this unique hunger and passion connected to different things. But God wants to restore that hunger and passion for his presence and power. See, in the Garden of Eden, God strategically placed man in this wonderful place of paradise. It was a place of paradise and pleasure, Eden. That's what it literally means, pleasure and paradise. And God strategically placed Adam in this environment But the main focus of the environment was his presence and power. And that was the main focus. You see, environment is important, is important. See, everything has a specific focus in regards to environment. You know, right now in this room, we have speakers that are strategically placed and it's helping to amplify my voice. And this is the perfect environment for those speakers. Now, if you were to take one of these speakers home and connect it to your um, alarm clock, (laughs) you, your household, and probably your whole neighborhood would despise you. (laughs) Yeah. That's the wrong environment. Say environment is important. Now, I have my laptop here. Many of you have maybe like laptops or other devices, and they have a certain environment that they need to be in. Like this is the perfect environment for my laptop to be in. Now, if I was to go to my kitchen sink, run some water, and place it in that environment, what would happen to it? It would malfunction. So that's the wrong environment for that. But if I had a fish that was alive and I placed it in the water in the sink, that fish would thrive in that environment because that's the environment that it was made for. But if I take that fish out of that environment, it will malfunction. Put something 
that is not supposed to be in that environment, it malfunctions. Put something that's not put something that's supposed to be in that environment and take it out of that environment, it malfunctions. Take man out of the presence and power of God, and what happens? He malfunctions. See, man's original environment is supposed to be in the presence and power of God. But when man sinned, the presence was gone. When man sinned, he came out of the presence of God, and then he starts to malfunction. See, we see in Genesis chapter 6, this is a powerful indictment against man because it's not anybody else that's making this claim. It's only God that is saying this. The, in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuing. That is, that is seriously deep. Can you imagine that? Every intention, that, mean, that intention also means purpose. Every purpose of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continuous. See, that puts man in a, in a place of no hope. Really was a hopeless place for us. But we thank God for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who through his cross, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, he makes a way for us to come back into our original environment, back into the presence and power of God. That's good news, isn't it? That's really good news. Sounds like something that we should be sharing. <laughs> but having said that, I have, a, I have another question. Knowing this and knowing that we have, oh, we have this way, we have this access to come boldly back into the presence and power of God, why is it that we, it seems like we're not going in as we should do? Why is it that it seems like we're not experiencing the presence and power of God as we should do? I want us to go to the Bible because that is our best place to know what God is saying to us. We're going to take a look at Proverbs. You know, Proverbs, we know, is the, is the book of wisdom. And we're going to be looking at Proverbs 24 and verse 13 and 14. See, one of the most important things for us to understand is that, as I said at the very beginning, God has placed a unique hunger, and passion for his presence and power. And if we are believers, if we are born-again believers, new creations in Christ Jesus, we have within us that hunger and that passion for the presence and power of God. One of the great examples for us is, is David. You know, in, in the Psalms, it, it talks about how David... Um, talks about his hunger and thirst for God and how he compares it to the deer that, that is longing for some water. 
And in the same way, he says his soul longs for the presence of God. He longs for God. He longs to see, when can I, when can I experience his presence once again? And one of the best ways that we have this advantage is that we can experience his presence and power through his word. In Proverbs 24 and verse 13, it says, My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the dripping of the honey are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul." If you find it, there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. Amen. That is powerful right there. You see, we see that example that that they're comparing the word of God to, to sweet honey. And just like honey is desirable to the taste, the word of God is desirable to our soul. And so it is important for us to have that hunger and passion for the Word of God. And in in that we have this wonderful desire within our hearts. And as we open up our hearts to the Word of God, and as we look into the Word of God, it's like even what Pastor Pastor Mark was teaching last week in in regards to the, uh, the book of Ephesians where it talks about the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. You know, it's he's just really trying to tell us what is already available to us. He's letting us know all these spiritual blessings and all these other things, we've already got it. And he wants us to be open to it. But we also see a contrast in this. See, in Proverbs 27, in Proverbs 27 and verse 7, this is powerful right here. It says, the full soul loatheth the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. It says, the full soul loatheth, that word loatheth literally means to trample underfoot, loads the honeycomb. So when we see this example that when we're talking about the word of God, you cannot, you cannot separate the word of God from the presence and the power of God. And you see, it says here, as we've already seen the example, that the that the honey is compared to the word of God and the honey is compared to the presence and power of God. We see that it says here that the full soul loads the honeycomb. See, that brings another slight indictment to us that maybe the problem, the reason why we don't seem to want to be or have that hunger and passion for the presence and power of God is maybe it's because we're full of everything else in this life. You know, I mean, right, you know, after, after church, many, many of us might be going for a Sunday roast, you know, and you could go to uh, whoever's house to, to have, or your house to have the, the Sunday roast, and, you know, you can have all the trimmings, everything that's in it, the potatoes, the, the chicken, whatever it is, all the good stuff. You can see some of you are getting hungry right now, just thinking about it, yeah? Oh, yeah, all that good stuff. And so, and you can, and you can just have as much as you want, and at the end of it, you're just sitting there just like, oh, yeah, that was good. That was good. But just say your friend then calls you up and says, hey, why don't you come down to my house for a, for a roast? I'm telling you, it is the finest roast. It is, it is the best. I've got, I've got a Michelin star uh, chef cooking it up. It is the best. I'm telling you, just come down. 
regardless of whether it's really great or not, you are full. And you'll be like, sorry, I, I can't, I can't, I can't stomach another thing. I'm full already. Oh, but come on, come on, it's the best. It's the best thing, I'm telling you. It will be so great for you. Friend, I'm okay. <laughs> I, I, I am full. Having said that, isn't that how we kind of re- approach the presence of, and power of God? We spent the whole week full of everything else and everyone else. And then we come here on Sunday and we give God the bare minimum of our hunger and passion. Once again, it seems like we're hopeless, isn't it? But once again, Jesus comes to our rescue, as he does time and time again. And he calls us out. He calls us out to to have a deeper relationship with him. He calls us to draw near to him. And that is so important for us, to come to a place where we understand that we must draw near to God. And we can't wait for him to draw to us, but it says that we must draw near for us. See, it says in, in James chapter four, it talks about how God is saying to us, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. So who's making the first step? We are. We have to make the first step. Oh, but Fred, you know what? This, this, I don't know about this. You know, this, this sounds like a lot of, you know, striving. This sound, feels like, you know, like a lot of effort. It feels like we're trying to, you know, almost kind of force things to happen. You know, God said that, you know, it's supposed to give us rest and stuff. But you see, it is very easy for us to stay in that kind of mode, stay in that kind of mindset that we give God the minimal. And so, you know, in the business world, one of the, one of the great things that, you know, we try and do is that we, we live by this principle of gaining the optimum results with minimal effort. Now, that's great for business, not so great for a relationship. I mean, can can you imagine, those of you that are in relationships, those of you that are married, let me talk to the ladies for a moment. Ladies, ladies. (laughs) Those of you that are married, like, I just want to, you know, put it out there, you know, can you imagine if your husband came to you and the only way that he showed his, his, his hunger and his passion for you was to tap you on the shoulder and say, you're a good woman. <laughs> and then he only did that on a Sunday. <laughs> see, 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 my wife is over there. She's like... Oh, oh, no way, no way. Can, can I get an amen from the ladies, yeah? Can I get an old oh man from the men? Oh, man, I've got to fix up. And if, 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 you're, if, that's, if that's your situation, you know, I'm, I'm going to report you to Pastor Trevor and Pastor Mark, you know, for some marriage counseling. You know, and I say that, but this is what we give God. Say amen or oh me. 
But I, but I want us to delve deeper because even with all of this, God is drawing us closer. In James chapter four, reading from verse five, and it says, or do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns, now that word yearns means to um, have an intense passion and desire and love for someone. But the spirit yearns jealously for us. See, it is very important for us, and let me just get a bit of clarity in regards to the term jealousy, because sometimes we think of that, that term jealousy as almost like this weird human emotion. You know, you, you kind of like have this picture of you looking at someone, looking, looking at them the, with a the side eye, the corner of their eye, and you're looking them up and down, and you're kind of like wishing, wishing, what, wishing you had what they had and stuff. You know, and, and we kind of think that that's jealousy. But, but to be honest, that's more like envy. It's more envy than, and, and as, you know, this biblical term of covetousness, meaning that you, you want what they want. But godly jealousy is God seeing the intention of the enemy to distract you with everything else in life, to, to cause you to be frustrated, to cause you to have anxiety, to cause you to have fear. And then the enemy comes to God and say, look at your people. Look at your children. They don't trust you. And I'm going to have my way with you. And it's that picture of God saying, I will not let you have your way with my children. No, you don't have the right intentions for my children. I'm standing for my children and I'm going to be there for them. I'm not going to let any of you, I'm not going to let any of your plans come to take away my children from me. See, and that's the godly jealousy that, that God displays for us. And the beautiful thing is that in the next verse it says, but, but God gives more grace. God gives grace. That's a wonderful thing. In Romans it talks about where sin abounds, Grace abounds much more. See, even when we do miss the mark, even when we, even when we go, go astray, there is the grace for us. And you see, God is saying, come back. Draw near to me. And when we choose to draw near back to him, when we choose to, to just tap into that, that yearning, that hunger, that passion for for his presence and his power. God, just like, just like he does for the, the prodigal son, he comes running. He comes running to us. And he comes to embrace us with his grace. That is so important. And it's time for us to embrace his grace. It's time for us to truly embrace all that God has for us. Because God has an intense hunger and passion for us. And he's placed that. And it's time for us to connect back into the environment that he's called us to be. It's time for us to, to connect back into the presence and the power of God. Because you cannot have the presence without the power of God. And the most important thing, just as Jesus said, that when you keep my commandments, ooh, when it says keep, that's a powerful word. Because we generally think it means obey but it talks about guarding. Can you imagine people spend thousands upon thousands of security systems, security guards with, with weapons, all of that to guard rocks like diamonds. Spend thousands, possibly millions, how much more precious is the presence and power of God? 
the God that created that rock, how much more precious and powerful it is to be able to keep that wonderful commandment that as Christ loves us, we are to love one another. We are to love people in this world. And that's how we show that we are disciples. And we are to treasure and, and prize his word. And that's the most, and that's the, the thing that must be the most important thing to us. See, I get it that, you know, we're in this world and, it's, and it can be so distracting. You know, I, I know what it's like, you know, we've got so many devices, you've got social media, you've got every kind of app offering you, you know, thousands of movies, and, you know, you've got a busy week, whether you're working or whether you're studying, and you've got, or you've got your children and everything, and sometimes you are just tired, and you just want to chill. You just want to relax. But you see, this is a picture of a person who gets God involved a little bit of their life. God doesn't just want to be a part of your life. He wants to be at the center of your life. That he has full reigns over your heart. For the Lord wants the seat and rule in your heart. Who sits on the seat of your heart? Who sits in rule? Who sits in reign? And the Lord wants to say this to you, that I want my seat back. I want my seat back. This is the time. This is the time. This is the season for us to turn back to him. This is the time for us to realize that we must go beyond just an apology before God and forgiveness. But we must change the way we think. We must allow the Lord to have free course and free reign in our lives. And I'll end on this. It says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, seeking to show himself strong, to manifest himself, to show himself strong, to show his power, to show his presence, to show his grace, to show his mercy, to show his compassion, to show his love, to heal our hearts. He wants to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. It's time for our loyalties to change place. It's time for our loyalties to connect back to its rightful place for us to be in the rightful environment that we should be in, for us to flourish. Because it's in his presence is the fullness of joy. In his presence is the place of peace. In his presence is the place of mercy. In his presence is the place of grace. Thank you, Lord. Let us turn back. I'd like you all to stand.